Hello everyone, Simon Jacobson here for another episode of Meaningful Live. Exodus 2024, Gaza, Iran, and Egypt. This program is dedicated by Adam Stern in memory of Esther and Gabrielle Richard Stern with great thanks and blessings. So I think the name speaks for itself. We are exactly in the period of the Exodus Passover, which takes place literally in the coming week, a week from now. And Exodus, of course, may be the most uh, famous story of slavery and liberation documented in the Bible, made famous by the Ten Commandments, Prince of Egypt, and many other, um, we can even call it cinematic literature and other parts of our history that have been affected by the Exodus, including actually the Founding Fathers seeing this country, the United States, as their own personal Exodus, and uh, seeing the United States as the Promised Land. So many, many lessons to be learned. But it's all playing itself out right where it all began. The story of Exodus happened exactly 3,336 years ago. Over three millennia, 3,336 years ago. In the Middle East, but not just the Middle East, Egypt, of course, Sinai, and Gaza, which is right at the Sinai Strip, Gaza Strip, Israel, and now Iran has exposed its, uh, itself, till now working through proxies, now in its direct attack for the first time, shooting over 300 drones and missiles and ballistic missiles, against Israel, thank God, most were thwarted with minimum damage. But it's hard to ignore, for any thinking person, the parallels. But the battles still rage. Once it was Egypt enslaving the Jewish people and them freeing, being freed and liberated and ultimately becoming a great nation, traveling through the Sinai all the way to, um, to, to the Promised Land, to Israel, and throughout history, the battles have raged from then all the way throughout history. Whether you're talking about the Assyrians or the Babylonians or the Persians or the Greeks and then the Romans and the Ottomans. I mean, the list goes on, the battles over Jerusalem, over Israel. And now again, Persia, ancient Persia known as Iran, has launched its attack. No surprise, because Iran has already voiced, and as I said, using its proxies. So how do we make, what do we make of all of this? It's one thing, we all are disturbed by battles and wars and attacks against innocent people. But when you see the historical backdrop, there's no question it has to bring up some, something, some deeper choreography, some secret story, some narrative that is taking place here. I'd like to talk about that especially in the context of Exodus. So what is really the story, the cosmic story, if you wish, as the mystics explain it, the story of Exodus, that the word actually for Egypt in Hebrew is the word Mitzrayim, which means something quite powerful. It's referring to constraints, all the limitations, all the inhibitions, all the fears and insecurities, anything that feels that traps us, that limits us, is considered to be the cosmic and the psychological, emotional Egypt or Mitzrayim. So, of course, Exodus from Egypt is the idea of transcendence, the transcending of our boundaries, of our barriers, of our state of distress, our dire straits, again, anything that limits us, that confines us. And that's really the story, the story of what is freedom and true freedom. Freedom is not just freeing yourself of your shackles, of a ball and chain, because there are many people who are not in prison physically, but they're, in, but they're enslaved by their addictions. They're enslaved by their, they're enslaved by their fears. They're enslaved by technology. They're enslaved by different um, substances, physical ones or psychological ones that keep them trapped. Freedom is far deeper than a physical freedom. It's also emotional, psychological freedom. Feeling that you can be yourself. Feeling that you don't, are not, you don't need to conform you don't need to, you're not being imposed upon by others' demands and expectations and, uh, def and, and definitions and so on. 
You know, many people talk about how their parents demanded certain things. You need to become a doctor or a lawyer or some other career to satisfy your parents. And it wasn't me. To sing your own song, to ask your questions. One of the key cardinal cornerstones of Passover is the questions that children are encouraged to ask. Questions. Because questioning is the ultimate, ultimate personification of the dignity of a human being that you do not have to be trapped by someone else's dogma. You're entitled to ask questions. You're entitled to be able to challenge, to push back. And from childhood on, we're taught to ask questions. What is the first thing a totalitarian regime, a fascist regime do? They don't let you ask questions. Mind control, brain control, mind control. Then control information. They, they, they establish a bureau of truth and information. As soon as you hear there's a Bureau of Truth and Information, you can rest assured it's neither true nor information. Pravda, the large newspaper in, in Russia was always called Pravda. Pravda means truth. How many newspapers would you trust that was called the truth? This is the truth. Because, because any opposition is not tolerated because it's threatening. Freedom means freedom of expression. I am free to ask my questions. I'm free to express myself. And that's the cornerstone. That's true freedom. Freedom freedom of spirit. The freedom to be you. Be the unique you to sing your song, not someone else's song, and not suppress your song. Oliver Wendell Holmes in The Voiceless bemoans, alas to those that die with their song still inside them. Here's the exact opposite. To allow your song to be sung to sing it, to have the courage to sing, to be you. So that's really what the meaning of Exodus is. And Exodus, therefore, is not just an event that happened over three millennia ago. It's happening right now. Everything that traps us, whether it's physical, whether it's emotional, whether it's psychological, whether it's within or without, is a form of slavery. And Exodus is the ability to transcend, to break out. So how does that apply to the events happening in Israel right now? What is it that they want? What is it that Persia or Iran wants? What is it that Hamas wants? What is it that the Arab countries and the Muslim countries that have surrounded Israel and have declared war against it over the years? Thank God there are some that have made peace with Israel. But those that still declare, what is it that they want? What is the war about? Is it about territory? Is it about money? What is the war about? Now, nobody likes to hear the word religious war. But it is. It is a war about what real freedom is. Because let's talk about religion for a moment. In this country, we have one of the freedoms, the Bill of Rights is freedom of religion. It doesn't say freedom from religion, of religion. There's no established religion in in, in the United States. You're free to be any way way you wish to be. You're free also to not be religious if you don't want. It's essentially the idea that we are not being imposed upon by anyone, even not by religious authorities. God created every human being. All men are created equal, the words of the Declaration of Independence. And by, the, and by, that, very, by that very concept, endowed by the Creator with unalienable rights, including the freedom of religion, freedom of expression, and so on, freedom of press, So who was the first person who championed freedom? It was Abraham, the biblical Abraham, close to 4,000 years ago, 3,800 years ago. He defied his own family, his own community, his own country. Pagan rule. Pagans ruled the world. And it was a dictator, a totalitarian leader. And then it was Nimrod that was the leader. You know, it's only 250 years since the first institutionalized democracy was established called the United States. 250 years. In a scheme of, we're talking about close to 4,000 years. But there was a man that stood up for freedom and he said, we're, all, we're not created by other human beings. And we don't bow to other humans. And we don't bow to human institutions. We connect to the divine. To something that's beyond human. Something beyond creation. The creator of it all which is of a different reality. People ask, well, if nothing can create itself, so who created the creator? That's exactly the point. The creator is not like any other creation. It's an essential reality. You want to call it the higher reality. 
sometimes called a non-existential existential reality, and other such names and references, without really a definition, but there's a sense of something beyond. He realized that that would be the only way to really appreciate what truth is. And that's one person's truth, as opposed to another partisan truth. And he committed his life, not to self-interest, but to the exact opposite, to the interest of the greater good, of that higher reality, a life of justice and of virtue and of kindness and of generosity, Ideals that we all cherish today, that have become institutionalized in the United States and in so many other countries of the world. Freedom House records how many countries are considered free today. Free. How many are semi-free and how many are not free at all. And the numbers continue to be, to be very optimistic how freedom has control. What is defined as freedom? We don't have one person or one group defining the standards for everyone else. So Abraham championed that back then, but it was only a minority that embraced it, the people Abraham reached. Now, he had two children. He had a child called Ishmael, and he had a child called Isaac. Isaac, in turn, had two children, Esau and Jacob. And these would become the ancestors of the three major religions today. Isaac and Jacob, ancestors of the Jewish people. Ishmael, the ancestor of the Arab Muslim world. And Esau, the ancestor of the Christian Roman Western world. And they were battling back then in the tents of Abraham. What was the battle about fundamentally? It was about the tension between matter and spirit, the tension between these higher values and self-interest. And how do you integrate the two? And it's not easy because there are battles involved. Different interests are tugging in two different directions. We all have this conflict within each one of us. Am I going to serve myself or am I going to be loving and kind to others? Selflessness or self selfishness? And we need to find a way to integrate. We're not talking about annihilating the self. We're also not talking about compromising the greater good, the integrity of the whole. And Abraham worked hard at teaching his children. It was not easy. That's why they struggled. And you see that sometimes religious passion and faith, for all its seemingly virtue, can also end up being very destructive because it needs to be tempered. Remember, a passionate holy war, a jihad, can be far more dangerous than a war that's being fought over territory because you say it's the name of God. It's a divine war. It's what God wants. It's not just what I want. If it's territory or property or land or, uh, or money, okay, we can find a compromise. But if it's the name of God... There's a certain intolerance. And indeed, Israel becomes the hotbed. Israel is the ground zero of where this conflict is amplified. In the words of Jacob in the Bible, that this is the mountain in Jerusalem, the Temple Mount, is the gate to heaven. It's the interface between heaven and earth. So of course, the conflicts between heaven and earth, between spirit and matter, between self-interest and greater interest between an egocentric life and a mission-centric life will come in full, in full, in full, uh, in the full, full ablaze in its full glory, that battle. And that's indeed the battle over history. And sometimes it's masked and, and, and couched in religious terms, a religion that doesn't tolerate another. It's my religion as opposed to yours. When you read the godfathers, if you wish, I don't know if that's the right word, but you read the founding fathers, you read the thought leaders of Muslim fundamentalism, like Sayyad Qutb, Q-U-T-B, and others. These were the mentors of people like Osama bin Laden and others. You see that Islam was meant to replace Christianity, which was meant to replace Judaism. So therefore, any Jewish presence that has any control in, that, in, in the world is considered to be sacrilegious. I don't want to go into the details of this, something I've discussed at length, but this is a, this is a war, it's an ideological one. It's not about just, let's find some middle ground. It's a zero-sum game. And what is the response? The response is that God created us all. 
And Abraham is our forefather of all of us, father of all nations. And he said, find harmony within diversity. Serve your God. Why do you feel threatened by another? Why do you need to take away something from another? The Jewish people were given a promised land, a small little sliver of land. The Muslim or the Arab countries were given so much more land. The Christian world was given its land. Why do you need to, 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 encro- to in, 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 encroach on upon the others bound over up, across other people's boundaries? And yet the battle continues to rage time and again. So everyone would like to say, okay, let's just find a peaceful agreement and so on. But until you don't get to the core issue of the belief system that the goal is to integrate in a beautiful, harmonious way, that is ultimately what Abraham taught, through love, through inspiration, not through war, not through violence. But for some reason, the Jewish people in Israel remain that threat in the eyes of, I'll say, some of the Muslim world. Maybe most, maybe all even. Not all necessarily want to call upon war. The main deterrent is because Israel is a strong military. But there's something deeper here. The call. Christianity was once extremely violent. Crusaders. They also had their jihad. It wasn't called jihad. Their holy wars. And then they became tamed. And not just tamed. Look at the United States. A country founded by Christians. Deists but a country that guarantees the haven for people of all backgrounds. Without that imposition, a free country, the freedom we're talking about. So when you look at the events today, it all comes back down to that war over for freedom. Now this is not suggesting one person is completely right and one is completely wrong, but one thing is for sure, violence, war is not the way. That was not the way of Abraham. And that's not the way of true faith. It's not the way of God, because all human beings are God's children. Let's not, forget, let's not forget that. Any human being that forgets that is not thinking about God. Because if you love God, you love what God loves. You love his children. To say, I love God, but I'll kill a few of his children, no. There's a tremendous distortion there. And this is what lies at the heart of it. And that's what we should be fighting for. The war is not over just don't kill, don't rape, don't pillage, don't attack, don't, be a, don't, don't, don't uh, perpetrate the worst form of, of bestial behavior, savage behavior. That's a given. The real war is to celebrate the divine image in which every human being was created. That's what Israel always represents. That's what Torah represents. That's what the Jewish people represent. And indeed, that's what the Christians and the Muslims should represent if they don't yet. We all embrace that. That's the war. And we should join together with that. Where are our world leaders? Where are the people of vision that are getting up and saying that? When you see all these attacks, whatever form they take, we're not talking about taking sides. The call, a call for all the dignity of every human being. Now, instead, everyone's going to blame the other. You're the one that does not allow that dignity. You're the one that is enslaving another. Well, if you have such grievances, let's talk about it. How much of it is myth? How much is real? People can use any excuse. I mean, the Nazis justified the killing of Jews because they felt the Jews were the oppressors, that the Jews were to the Bolshevik and then the socialist and Bolshevik uh, and, uh, and capitalist, as contradictory as that may sound, were trying to control the world. I have no doubt that the truth will prevail as it has prevailed. But this is the time that all of us have to rise and experience a true Exodus 2024. So when we look at Gaza and Iran and Egypt of the past and the Egypts in each of our hearts and souls and the figurative and metaphorical Egypt, this is what we can be thinking about. How to find that transcendent place. And we begin with, ultimately, Humility. The bittel, the Hebrew word bittel, a modesty, a humility, suspending yourself. It's not about you. It's about something greater than you. What does God want of us all? 
And in that sense, each one of eight billion people on this planet are all part of God's plan. We're all musical notes, indispensable musical notes, in a large cosmic composition, each one needing the other, each one complementing the other, and each one necessary. That is what we should be championing, championing, championing. That's what we should be declaring. That should be our mandate as we continue to forge our way through this 21st century. Imagine if we can join hands together with that type of message that transcends and is beyond any form of group or ethnicity or race or culture or color. Imagine what kind of world we would create. Absolutely doable. And history is a witness. Things have improved dramatically. We have still much work to do. No one denies that. But it's not the same as it once was. Those values that Abraham pioneered have become part and parcel, an integral part of society today. And will continue to become that. But we have to be proud to we have to be proud to um, declare that. We have to be proud to stand behind that. And not just be timid and say, okay, just don't kill me, leave me alone. We cannot just be anti anti Semitism or anti-anti-discrimination. Or anti-discrimination, I should say. We have to have something to fight for, to bring more light and love. And our passion for light and love should be greater than the passion and demonic passion of any of the enemies who advocate and, uh, and, and propagate hatred and destruction. That light will prevail Passover is a testimony to that. 3,336 seders that we made where we say clearly that every generation there are those that rise to destroy, but there's a greater force at work that allows us to prevail, not just prevail, but to thrive and to flourish. Thank you so much. Everyone be well and be blessed. May we only see peace in the promised land, peace all over the world, peace in each of our hearts and souls. And may we all be Part of the solution, not part of the problem. This has been Simon Jacobson, Meaningful Life Center, MeaningfulLife.com. Check us out. Please subscribe to our offerings, our YouTube channel. Please share. I'd love to hear your feedback, your thoughts, your comments. Be well and be blessed.